So maybe we should get started if you are okay. People are still going to join in and we'll, we'll keep admitting them. <laughs> Thank you so much. So our friend of the ACO, Ada Rose, who kindly gave us an interview uh, several months ago, is back to introduce Maremi Andriozzi. I'm, am I saying the name right? Maremi. Yep. You Maremi. Did. Yeah. It's close to Mariana. So that's. Yes, <laughs> that's yes <good>. it is. <laughs> is it an Italian? Uh, no, it's not. It's a combination of Martha and Emily. And my oh, grandma that's... combined her names. That's perfect. And so then I got that. <laughs> oh, wonderful. There are not very many of them out there. No, right. <laughs> Well, so if you like, um, Ada, Rose, take it away and we'll um, let us know when you want us to ask questions and so on. I'm going to mute myself now and take it away. Thank you so much to both of you. Oh, our pleasure. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to do a very brief introduction because I want Maremi to mostly talk. But if I think of something that's she's mentioned to me in the past, that's really interesting. I'll just jump in and, and ask her about it. And I do have an opening question. But anyway, I met Maremi about three years ago, which is hard to believe because we have such a history of showing together and being together and experience art, experiencing art together. But I do a series of talks in the gallery, which sort of got suspended during COVID. But I would invite three guest artists to talk for 10 minutes each. And they weren't necessarily artists that I represented. And one of them was Maremi. She had attended some of them. And I remember asking her, and I was familiar with work that she was doing that, that was abstract. And she came that morning to do a talk in the gallery and she brought the first of those history adorned portraits. And I looked at them and I thought, wow, I love these. I just fell in love with them. And I was getting ready to go to an art fair and I asked her if I could bring them with me. Um, but anyway, um, I... Those were the solo. She's gone on to do uh, duo portraits and triple portraits, which she's going to, I'm sure, talk to you about. Um, but I remember those first early ones, and they started sort of, I remember, sort of in the 16th century, and she's come up to the up to the 20th century, not moved into the 20th century. They're really history-adorned pieces. And a lot of the early ones were queens um, and rulers, and but she's really done so many interesting women. And so, well, I'll just say a few more things. Um, they're done as silhouettes, as you can see, and she'll tell you more about that. I'm a big lover of fashion and couture. And so the original ones with those adornments, the jewelry, the crowns, the lace, but even the simpler ones of, you know, enslaved women and healers, the adornments are so exquisite, the earrings, just the hats, everything. And she really does a lot of research on them and looks at the Met Costume Institute. And I love that side of them. And of course, as being a history major, I, 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 I love the history behind them. And obviously I love the idea of the feminism and resurrecting these women's stories. So my first question to Maremi, because it's the question I get asked the most is, how do you find the women that you wanna paint? Okay, so um, uh, a number of different ways. Um, let's see, sometimes people will suggest people to me and I will um, uh, put them down, sort of store them in the back of my head as um, you know, somebody for the future. I, I kind of have to come to the women on my own. Um, I do have like a little notebook that I keep with, um, people sort of notes that I want to go back to. Sometimes my daughter has recommended people to me. Um, she's this one, when, when she was in elementary school, she'd always, you know, have somebody that I should look at. Um, but generally speaking, I sort of um, come to them on my own sort of. Yeah. And I, I kind of have to connect to them in a certain, in a way um, there has to be an element of the story that I, find interesting and that I want to um, raise awareness of. And then there has to be, the woman also has to be, um, uh, I have to feel like she'll connect with more than just me in a way too. So um, I present, I prepared a little presentation. So if you don't mind, I'll just share my screen and I'll, um, and then if there are questions, um, feel free to jump in. Okay. Okay. All right. So thank you again for that nice introduction. And um, 
History of History Adorned. And it's not a very long series, but I've actually um, done quite a bit with it. So um, as Ada Rose mentioned, I started with, um, let's see if I can, with uh, early um, in 2019 with um, influential women, noble women, aristocrats, um, women who um, had commissioned big portrait um, series um, in the case of Maria de' Medici. Um, and I was looking at a lot of um, paintings and historical sources for my inspiration. And uh, Ada Rose mentioned the lace and the, the jewels and a lot of these women from the um, 15th, 16th and 17th century. I mean, they're just, you know, uh, there's just the the embellishments are just sort of over the top. So I wanted to kind of capture that sense of how does a woman during this time frame create her identity? And how does she exert her power? Because at this time in history, women were sort of married as tokens and pawns. And um, so they, in some ways, lost their identity. I mean, they also lost their names whenever they got married as well. So um, portraiture was a way of sort of reclaiming themselves um, and and also uh, as a way of showcasing what they had done. So it was a marketing tool as well, you know, like I, in this case, Maria de Medici, Medici it's, you know, commissioned um, a number of Rubens uh, paintings. So, I mean, it's a way of sort of saying, look what I've done with myself and look what I have done for um, this country. Okay, and Anna Mendoza. Um, so a lot of these women sort of uh, straddle this this uh, space between fact and fiction when you start to research them. And there's sort of this element of fantasy that's involved with them. So um, there's the things that we know and the things that of course have become um, sort of larger than life. And I also wanted to these portraits to kind of have that element of like, what is real and what's not real. Um, so in the case of Anna Mendoza, you know, there's this rumor that she lost her eye in a fencing accident and um, her husband was involved in um, an espionage uh, attack against Philip II. And so then she was imprisoned in jail for um, 11 years. And there's this whole sense of um, princess and lost, um, lost narrative that I was trying to sort of recapture with, with these early women. Um, Sedona, the sorceress and Empress Dowager Chow Queen. So I was really kind of looking at women um, all over the place um, in all corners of the world. And I wanted that sort of uh, sense of um, this was happening all over the place. Not this is not unique. We're we're often taught European history, but I wanted this sense of like these characters are also present in other corners of the world. We just haven't really been exposed to them. Um, and I I also with this series when I first started, I was thinking about um, uh, the National Women uh, Museum of the Arts. Their Can you name five women challenge? Um, well, they for their challenge, they have five women artists, but I also was sort of um, extending that to, can I name five women from India? Can I name five women from France? Can I name five women from uh, Spain? And so it, it sort of got me thinking um, that I really had a lot of gaps in my uh, knowledge and I really wanted to. So in some ways, approaching these portraits is a way of me learning about these people um, and also sharing them in a way that I thought um, that I could do and sort of advocate for them. Okay, there we go. Can you guys see my screen or see this? Uh, okay, so, um, so and then uh, with uh, these three are also three newer ones. So warriors, um, uh, concubines, Izumunu Kunu was um, was known with Kabudu and in Japan. And uh, so I, I was really trying to find women that I thought were interesting, fascinating, sometimes a little um, controversial in a way too. 
And so each of the women has a uh, biography that goes with it. And so um, it's very important to me when I post my work, I usually have some sort of synopsis of what um, I can find on the web. And I, I try to keep it more factual and not about my interpretation of them. But I think when you look at my pieces, you can um, you can interpret them in a, in a number of different ways. But getting to um, you know that idea of how do we connect with these people? Um, so, and then I'm also often asked too about the the blackened faces and what um, why I uh, don't um, do details in their face. And originally, I was more interested in their adornment and like how they wanted to present themselves because portraiture is so much about how. Um, you want to tell your story. Um, and then I was also interested in the fact that there are certain women like Elizabeth or Marie de Medici or Catherine the Great that we we already know what they look like. So that's really not important in our head. We already have sort of that that image in our mind's eye. So there's an element of you can fill in those gaps. I mean, do you see yourself in this woman? Um and then there's also some of these women actually do not have portraits that were created during their lifetime. Um, they were not rich and famous. Um, and so the black and face also sort of registers that omission that, that that wasn't, they weren't considered important or they didn't have the, the resources to actually have um, a picture created during their lifetime. So, I mean, I often talk about in my artist statement that they're the anonymous woman um, and they're the every woman. So she could be anybody or she could be you um, or she could be her. So there's this this sort of bridge that I'm trying to create that I want a viewer to um, part of the story and part of the, the portrait as well. There we go. So, and then um, moving forward, uh, Ada Rose very nicely asked me to participate in a show um, in 2021, Maybe You Live in Interesting Times. So whereas my early portraits were very graphic and a little bit on the pop side, sort of solid backgrounds and uh, very two-dimensional with the, the jewels being the three-dimensional element. Um, for this show, I wanted to, um, get into, I wanted to per portray more African-American women and um, to do, and also American, African-American women. So um, to do that, I felt like I had to go into the 20th century, um, at 19th and 20th century. And also I was relying a lot more on photography to for my sources, which originally I hadn't really wanted to do because I felt like photography would what what else could I possibly contribute to a photograph of a woman that was known? Um, but I found that it was challenging in different ways in that um, just because you thought you knew her doesn't necessarily mean that it it wasn't my interpretation of her. So it, it became challenging in different ways. Um, what else about these people? Let's see. So, oh, yes. So a lot of these people were sort of pioneers in their field. They were the first people to um, be uh, uh, Native American doctors or first people to um, be seamstresses for um, uh, Abraham Lincoln, um, or not Abraham, for um, a Mary Todd Lincoln um, or astronomers. So I, I had this sense of like, these were inspirational women. They weren't just queens and pirates. I had just sort of moved on to like a more concrete narrative that I felt that um, uh, viewers could really relate to. So here's another scene from that show. Um, and here's some details of two of the women, or here's some, Elizabeth Greenfield, who was uh, one of the first um, African America opera singers, and Emily Warren Roebling, who um, uh, worked on the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, she was an engineer. 
So, and then with from the um, 1900s, uh, 1800s, they did not have quite as many jewels. So I um, started working on their clothing more and their dress and thinking about um, the backgrounds and how to make the backgrounds relate to um, the figures in the foreground. Um, and then this was uh, very exciting. The Zimmerelli Museum acquired uh, four of the pieces, four of my pieces, um, and Ada Rose very nicely uh, donated Rebecca Rolf to the museum. So here's an installation shot showing um, two of the pieces that are in the Rutgers collection. And this was such a highlight. Um, and it's, uh, it's thrilling to think that um, they are being looked at within a museum context. So, and then in 2021, I started a series where I was uh, working on um, arts and letters. Um, so uh, combining an artist and a poet or a writer together. So um, it was a way of sort of um, bridging two characters or two historical figures together and um, acknowledging that, you know, great women don't sort of come out of nowhere. They're sort of, um, they're inspired by their environment. They're, so they're in inspired by the things they read or um, the things that are um, in their environment. So uh, Bertha Morsot and George Sand, both that sort of French connection, Anna Archer and um, France, Francisca, um, Danish artist and um, interest in that, let's see, yes, um, Abigail and Maria, both Brazilian, um, one an artist, one a, po one a writer, Hilma Afklit and Annie Bassat. Um, they actually came from different places, but um, information that Annie's work influenced Hilma's, Hilma's work, so. Um, I was interested in this, uh, this, you know, co, co teaming. Um, so, and then I also do a series of, uh, history dorm teams. So a number of women together, um, in this case, the suffragist, um, which I did during the, uh, fall of 2020, um, as sort of a reaction to the presidential, um, election and all the efforts to, overturn um, the democratic process. So this was thrilling because this piece was in the Phillips collection, in the Phillips show that they had um, uh, soon after and, uh, and and was purchased by a collector. So it's, it's always nice when your work goes to a good home. Um, and uh, uh, Harry Giles and Sophia Packard who were, um, women who started Spelman College, but they did it um, when they were in their 50s, which I am always, um, you know, I, I love this idea of um, uh, capturing women during different parts of their lifetime. Um, and then Kate and Suki, who um, will be part of my healers show that I'm coming up and getting ready to talk about that. Um, but Kate was a midwife um, at Mount Vernon and um, Suki um, also was a midwife and uh, uh, Kate in my portrait I have Kate actually uh, training with Suki. Um, Kate um, petitioned George Washington to um, be trained as a midwife and um, so Kate was an enslaved woman. Suki was um, her husband was the overseer at, um, at, at uh, Mount Vernon. Okay, so history dorm. So this is the the most current season, the uh, current, most current uh, work that I'm working on right now. And um, so, um, so I began this work. Um, a couple things inspired this work. Um, first of all, we had just come out of well, not officially, but we were sort of the tail end of COVID. So there was this interest in the pandemic and healthcare workers and the people that um, uh, were behind the scenes healing people. And um, 
it, with part of that was the interest in, you know, past plagues. How had we, uh, as a world, how had we um, dealt with past pestilence and the Spanish flu and the Black Plague and that sort of things, and how women had um, been the backbone of the healthcare system even prior to um, our most recent exposure to COVID. Um, and then also uh, inspired by um, Samuel Alito's writings and the Supreme Court's uh, decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, um, I was also interested in how women had um, exercised control over their own bodies. And um, the Eleanor Beer was somebody that uh, Samuel Alito wrote about in his um, initial um, writings um, as a case for why um, why it wasn't, uh, why it should be overturned. But Eleanor Beer was actually a, a sort of a very tragic case. And so I wanted to highlight women who um, had been misaligned, maligned and uh, how their stories had been manipulated to um, for political gain. Um, so Eleanor Beer, there's a 1732 Derby case in which she was convicted of um, providing an abortion to a servant who had been raped. And then she was sentenced for three years in prison and two days in the pillory. Um, and then if you read the proceedings, um, which are online, um, uh, she's barely, she barely speaks if uh, at all. And, um, the mayor says one of the reasons why she is guilty of this crime is because she kept an unclean house. So, I mean, it, it's almost laughable that, um, this would be used as validation for a political means. If you put your, yourself in her shoes, I feel like you would be extremely sympathetic to um, the plight of women during uh, the 18th century in England. Martha Barrett also has a very tragic story. Um, and she was also found guilty. She was found guilty of concealing a birth. Um, and during this time frame, this idea of um, abortion and um, uh, when a fetus was viable was much different from our interpretation, but I, I'm not going to go into that. But um, so she uh, was 36. She gave birth to an illegitimate child um, and the body was burned um, after the baby's body was burned afterwards. And then she was, um, despite the fact that she named the father, the father was not brought into the court case. Um, again, uh, she very little, her remarks are very, very few in the court proceedings. And then she's confined, she's sentenced and confined to 18 months of solitary. Um, anyway, there are a lot of other details that go along with that case. But both of these women uh, highlight women who were put in very uh, difficult positions and had to make uh, choices that were right for them at the time. And in the case of Martha Barrett, she actually um, took a ju juniper um, or savin uh, medicinal um, plant in order to try to uh, abort the baby, um, which is also can be deadly in a certain dosage. And so, I mean, she was a lay woman. So I guess what I'm trying to get is that these women would um, exercise extreme positions in order to uh, have autonomy over their lives. And our introduction to them is quite possibly on the worst day of their lives. So I also wanted this idea that, um, you know, women, everyday women um, have this place in history, even if it's just within a court proceeding. So our only knowledge of these women are through um, a single day in their the worst day of their life. Um, uh, let's see. So, and then I guess it it also with with my history of adorned healers. Um, now that I'm in my fifties and um, I have a thirteen year old daughter, um, this idea of like women's care is kind of taking a different 
um, role. Um, and I, I have a different perspective on it. And then I also have a son who is very special needs and will require um, a lifetime of care. So this idea of healers and how caregiving is given is um, kind of central to what I'm thinking about now too, personally. Um, so, okay, so this is a, a little bit of a geeking out moment, but um, you can find a lot of these court proceedings online. And I, um, when I go down my little rabbit holes of research, I find it endlessly fascinating that things from uh, the 19th century and the 18th century are right at our fingertips. Okay, here we go. So here are some more of my um, early healers. Biddy Early, who was an Irish, um, uh, where are my notes? Um, Irish herbalist and healer, and she was accused of witchcraft. Um, Hannah Woolley was an English um, servant who published um, a household recipe book and a, re a remedy book, remedy book um, housemaking tips called the Ladies' Directory, and it was self-published in 1661. And Ursula Fontenbuño, who was a Renaissance Tuscan apothecary, um, and she concocted and dispensed medicinal elixirs and spiritual rem remedies during the Renaissance. And she experimented with a lot of the new uh, Mediterranean herbs and botanicals from the Americas. And um, so each of these women are fascinating in themselves. I have little bios on each of them, and I'm happy to share them, to go into further detail or share those bios. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, Margaret Jones, who was a midwife, who was one of the first to be executed for witchcraft in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And um, uh, she was proven a witch because uh, she was watched as according to there was a, a manual that was published shortly before her case called the English Witch Fighter General. And uh, she was watched for 24 hours. And um, according to uh, her accusers, a an imp appeared, which was uh, an indication that she was a witch. Um, uh, Jane Minor, who was an African-American healer uh, from Virginia, who was emancipated, actually, after she helped during an 1825 fever epidemic in Petersburg, Virginia. And then after she was emancipated, she continued to practice health care. And she, um, with the proceeds from her care, she uh, was able to free several slaves, including another um, midwife or a healer. And let's see, where are we? And Jacqueline Felice, who, uh, where was, there we go, who was an empiric heiress who was convicted of um, practicing medicine without a, a license because um, the University of Paris had recently instituted, um, was trying to legitimize the uh, medical field and they said that women or everybody had to have a license in order to practice but of course um, schooling was not open to women so it was uh, a bit of a catch-all and um, so she in her uh, yes yeah, so not extended but she the thing about Paris is it was a, an enormous city at this time um, in, uh, let's see, so her her work period was 1290. So, um, so in order for all these, um, in order for there to be proper healthcare, there actually had to be women who were exercising healthcare, who were, you know, doing the daily care and um, on the front line of healthcare, let's see, okay, here we go. So, um, this was a really exciting project to work on, and I'm very excited to, to show these um, in the gallery. Um, these were enslaved African-American midwives, and uh, there's now a plethora of, well, there's a lot of new interest in the enslaved communities and a lot of the plantations along the East Coast, and uh, specifically in uh, Monticello and um, Mount Vernon and um, 
uh, there's a lot of interest in who were the people that lived there besides just the presidents and the president's wives and the children. And so it's really exciting going through um, the research that's available online and a lot of the doctoral studies and research uh, papers that um, now go into a lot more detail about some of these figures. And so I wanted to do some portraits of midwives from um, some of these enslaved communities. So Rachel uh, was a midwife at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello and Poplar Forest Plantation. And she's depicted with motherwort, which uh, was a uh, herbal element for uterus ailments and care. Nell was um, a midwife and a house ser servant at Gunston Hall uh, in Mason's Neck, Virginia. And uh, she is shown with red clover. Jane, is, that's actually not her real name. We don't know her name, um, but I gave her the name Jane um, uh, as like Jane Doe kind of, um, but we know about her, her existence through other letters, um, in which she's referenced. And, uh, so she was at, uh, Mont Montpelier with, uh, the Madisons. And then Kate, uh, is an enslaved worker from, uh, George Washington's Muddy Hole Farm, which was one of the five farms, uh, that it were, were part of George Washington's farms. And she's shown cotton bark root. Let's see. Here we go. And so here's some details of those, um, those paintings. And it was very important that I put the names in. Um, uh, Montpelier has a project where they're um, trying to name everybody. And it's an idea for, it's, it's a way for ancestors to, who have, um, sort of a sense of oral history for them to try to connect with some of these people and try to, you know, get in touch and maybe there's a connection, um, uh, an ancestral connection. So I, I felt it was very important to give them, even if we ask names and even if the names aren't quite right, um, I would love to go back in and change the names or give them last names at some point, if that's even possible. Um, and uh, this is another series that I uh, recently did, the women of Salerno, Italy, who um, another group of women that I found extremely fascinating. Um, the School of Medical, which was founded in the ninth century, was one of the first schools to educate men and women. And it was a flourishing environment that cla that combined classical Greek uh, knowledge with Arabic knowledge, and it admitted men and women. Um, so it was a pioneering um, institution and highly unusual. Uh, so Troda is probably the most well-known of all of these women. Uh, she was from and she was a health practitioner and a midwife and an author and educator. And she um, has a number of uh, very well-known work that is attributed to her that's in her name. Um, most radically though, she uh, was one of the women who said that uh, infertility was not just a woman's problem, but it, it also came from uh, the man's sperm. And so it was radical that she uh, uh, introduced this idea that it wasn't just a woman's problem. Um, Constanza Calenda, who was from the 14th century, was a surgeon who specialized in eye, eye diseases. Rebecca Guerna, who also from the 12th century, a surgeon who worked on, um, published papers on urine, on the embryo. And um, you see her with uh, the urine uh, samples in the corners and this idea that um, you would look at something like that would dictate what was problem, what was wrong with the patient. Abiela, who also from the 14th century, century specialized in embryology. Um, so there are some details in the corner that uh, talk about that. And Mercuriad from the 14th century who um, wrote on pestilent fever and open wounds. Let's see, I do have some details here. So this is Constanza's 
uh, piece. And I have um, the image of the two eyes, which is a reference to St. Lucy. And St. Lucy is um, a patron saint of uh, blindness. And Mercuriad, who um, I show here with a B because they used honey um, when they had open wounds to clean out the wounds. They didn't understand the antibacterial component of it. They understood that it prevented infection. Um, and then I have shown her here with a coral necklace, which has a religious um, uh, symbolism to it. And uh, this idea of like a garden, because I imagined that she would be uh, tending a garden with herbal um, things. So with each of these, these women, I sort of had to, there, there's no images of them. I had to create them. Um, so I did have to take some liberties with, um, with them, which was exciting because I felt like I was creating, bringing them to life in a way that they hadn't been br brought to life before. Um, and give it a personality in a way. Um, let's see. Okay. And okay. So then these are my last number 100 and number 101 history Dorn portraits, which I cannot even believe I've done these this many portraits. Um, when I started this, I thought, well, I'll just do 20. And then it was like, oh, well, I guess I'll do 50. And now like, I don't really count on a regular basis, but I just, uh, it's amazing to me that there are 101 women that, uh, I didn't know before or knew very little about and now have been able to sort of live in their shoes for a week or so and uh, research them and paint them and then share them. Um, it's just really exciting that this is all now um, history that I didn't know and history that I'm just so happy that I now am familiar with. Um, so Polly Cooper is a, a night of uh, the, uh, upstate New York who helped with Valley Forge. Um, she and a number of Oneida, uh, uh, Indian, um, uh, Native Americans came down, uh, during the winter campaign at Valley Forge, um, and helped during the American revolution. And Molly Ockett is another, uh, Abenaki healing woman, uh, Native American from, the New Hampshire and Maine area who um, is sort of a color, colorful character and their number of parks and things like that that are named after her as well. Um, so it, it sort of allowed me to time travel in a way by painting these portraits. I get to live in their shoes and think about uh, all these women living together or uh, you know, at the same time that all this happened um, is sort of an interesting and mind blowing experience um, at this, uh, let's see. Okay, and then I also wanted to share this. This is a, a new painting that I've done. Um, and uh, the Delaplane asked me to do in uh, Frederick, Maryland, asked me to do a painting that commemorated their 275th, uh, Frederick County's 275th anniversary. And they had a number of historians that had um, done sort of small clips of uh, researchers that had done, highlighted some of the places in Frederick, uh, Maryland. And um, so I chose Le Hermitage, which is on the current side of the Monocacy battlefield. And the idea was that recognizes history, but, you know, contemporary interpretation of history. Um, so this will be in a, a show this summer at Frederick, um, at, at the Delaplane, but uh, it highlights a very sort of tragic and sad part of history. Le Hermitage was a plantation um, and the Vincendiers uh, came from uh, current Haiti, uh, the Saint Dominica in uh, 1793. Um, uh, to, to Frederick, Maryland, uh, escaping the, um, Haitian revolution. And they came, um, they were French and they came, uh, they started off with 12 slaves and they ended up having over 90 slaves and 748 acre plantation. And it was, a uh, 
very brutal um, environment. They were extremely um, cruel with uh, their enslaved community. And um, by 1853, uh, Victoria, who was the last surviving um, member of this plantation um, owner had passed away. But, um, and then the Hermitage actually uh, was bought and it became the best farm and then et cetera, et cetera. So history has moved forward. But I wanted to get into the head of Victoria, who um, was very Catholic, very severe, um, not a very likable character um, in history. And to understand there were four enslaved um, members of her household that were freed on her deathbed. And I wanted to think about who would those four people be and what would what was in their head. Um, there were actually court cases that were brought against her for her cruelty in, um, so we know some of the names of the people that were on, um, and you can see I've written the names in the background and several of them tried to escape. So we, we know about them because she had put in advertisements and papers. Um, but I guess what I thought was most interesting about this is I've never really painted somebody that I didn't like. And so it was really interesting to paint somebody who was a villain um, and uh, to try to understand what made them that cruel. Um, so anyway, that is, um, let's see. I, oh yes, I have one more. So these are the dates of my upcoming show. So I hope you'll come. And um, I will be at the gallery quite a bit and I would love to talk further about um, pieces, more specific pieces um, in, in real life, in person. <laughs> so I hope you'll come and I will stop sharing my screen now. So let's see, stop sharing, great. And if you have questions, please. Thank you so much. This is so fascinating. Marimi, congratulations. Oh, oh well, thank um, you. Do, can you tell us a little bit about how you work with the acrylic and whether you consider doing it in a different medium or you take notes, you sort of do sketches in other media? What is your like physical process? My process. Um, I take notes. I it, my for, for my first for my earliest uh, heal. Uh, earliest history Dorn works, I would actually create folders of images, you know, paintings. And um, if there wasn't a, a painting of the woman that I was doing a portrait of, I would look, uh, did she have relatives who were contemporaries, that kind of thing. Um, I now rely more on Pinterest. Um, and then, so I create sort of folders in Pinterest. I also look at museum sites. Um, so looking at clothing collections and jewelry collections. Um, so I, I have like a visual sort of uh, in my hand. And then um, I actually don't do a lot of sketching prior. I work it all out on my, on the canvas or on the panel, which is challenging in and of itself because it's kind of like painting on glass. It's, um, it doesn't hold the medium very well. So you have to build up the surface so that there's a tooth to it. And um, so I oftentimes have to scrape down or sand work in order to get back to uh, if I've made a mistake and I need to go back to it. When I'm working on canvas, it's a lot more forgiving and can create layers and it's you don't see the ridges. For me, it's very important. The surface is very important too. So the black, faces um, have sort of a luster to them. And I actually really like that. Um, I had somebody ask me if I wanted to do, use a different type of black paint that had, um, that didn't have a reflective quality to it, but I actually like the reflective quality. Um, I think it, it sort of gets to my message. Yeah. 
Yeah, these these are really incredible pieces. Uh, I was actually wondering, um, as you were kind of going through them and talking about some more, more contemporary, I guess, 20th century uh, um, women, if you ever talk to families or relatives of the of the of the portrait uh, people run into situations where you're in discussion about who these people are with with more i don't know more human people less digital research less book research that kind yeah of um i did a portrait of belva lockwood and um she is her one of her relatives is my husband's very good friend from growing up so it was really exciting belva lockwood was one of the first lawyers to uh argue one of the first women lawyers to argue in front of the supreme court um and she's a washington dc sort of person so i was really excited to do her portrait um so after i did that i you know of course i had to show my friend and she was thrilled um, actually, one of the women that I painted was my 13th great grandmother. So, I mean, I, I actually really like the fact that all these women have relatives and they all, there's a history to them. They didn't, um, we all come from somebody and we're all related. So I, I like that idea that, um, yeah. Thank you. Now, the other question I was thinking of is like, well, you didn't just start here. I mean, you obviously was doing, we're doing art uh, prior to the series that you've been uh, kind of showing yeah. us. What did your work look like prior to this? Yeah. Um, well, I sort of geared this talk just towards the, this series because I've done a hundred of them. I sort of felt like, oh my gosh, I can't even believe that I know a hundred. I've done this a hundred times. Um, uh, but prior to this, I was doing, um, I called them my painted lady series and you can see them on my website, but it was, um, portraits of, um, female painters or female artists. And I was combining them sort of, uh, with vessels from their time period. Um, again, portraiture and this interested in embellishment and the story about how, the things that are around you, your cultural um, environment, your being and part of your history. Um, so I did like portraits of Sophonisba Angusola and uh, uh, Lavinia Fontana and um, Freda, Freda Galizia. And so a number of um, women from that I felt that needed more um, prominence. I wanted to introduce them in a way, but it's not traditional portraiture. It's again, this sort of idea that um, portraiture can be told through different, different ways. Yeah. So that's, that's a talk for another day, I guess. <laughs> and did your interest in portraiture start in, uh, did you go to uh, art school or were you are you sort of after? I did, yes. So yeah. I went to Cornell. I got a Bachelor of Fine Arts there. And then I went to Clemson and I got a Master of Fine Arts. Yeah. And I've also recently become, you mentioned um, portraiture. And I've, I've also recently become more interested in silhouettes and uh, how my work relates to the history of silhouettes to its um, uh, become more interesting to me, you know, is it the idea that silhouettes, um, originally were a way for people that weren't affluent to actually, um, create an image of themselves. Um, this sort of idea that every person could, could have a, an image of them, of their family members. Yeah. Yeah. I was immediately, uh, went to that idea of the cut paper kind of cut out of a silhouette and the people who go to villages and, and do those for people. Um, and I also, yeah. of course, of thinking of Carrot Walker and her use of silhouettes and also of course. The black silhouettes and yeah. so forth. Um, do you ever, just as a, as a question, do you ever run into any uh, pushback against the the, the idea? Um, I'm thinking of like how Dana Schutz was doing em Emmett Till and the, kind of the pushback that she got for doing something that was kind of out of her ethnicity or, 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 or things like that. Do you have any run into any issues of that? I, no, I, I have heard that. <laughs> I have. Um, I'm well aware of um, that and I'm very sensitive to it. Um, I think I try to create a body of work that um, represents all of womanhood 
and I see it as um, uh, history that reflects everybody. And I also feel like it's part of my history too, um, in a way. So I, I want to understand that for myself too. Yeah. yeah. There's some accolades on the chat. Oh, okay. I look. <laughs> people love your. Oh, thank you. Your work. Thank you. Um, the other th uh, question I had was you were kind of looking at different countries, you know, women from other countries like India, and I saw some from Japan, and so forth. Uh, how do you do research when you know maybe it's not in English or maybe it's in a different language? That is that is very challenging. Actually, like that gets to. Um, a uh, problem that I have sometimes is um, particularly with um, women from India and um, yeah, there, there are a lot of places, Africa, I'd love to do more women from Africa or even South America. There's just not a lot of research on some of these places. Um, and also um, like I did a, a woman from Turkey and there's even a different dress for different parts of Turkey. And I wouldn't even know the first place to start. So I do sometimes have to just take a leap and say, this is my interpretation. And um, I have to give myself that artistic freedom in a way and hope that somebody will, um, I hope somebody will correct me. I, I would love to know better actually. And I hope that somebody would look at this and say, um, you know, I would like to translate that manuscript that this is based on, you know, or whatever. Um, hopefully by putting these women out into the world, it will encourage more research and more scholarship. Yeah. yeah I never even thought of that. Like if you have ever had a situation where, you know, somebody comes in and be like, that's not the appropriate time period or the dress or something and have to go back and like change Jewelry yeah, or yeah. No, I mean, that that is very valid. Um, a lot of the women from Salerno, um, when a woman was married, she would have covered her hair. So um, I don't even know if those women were married. Um, that research is not even available. So I've, I've depicted them almost like they were in their 20s. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's really accurate. But I do, I'm in the business of making images and trying to get people interested in looking at images. So I have to um, sometimes not be accurate in order to create a very interesting painting. Yeah, I've had to kind of wrap my head around that too. Yeah. I, I keep thinking of like, you're creating the image of what these, you know, some of these people are, are known for and I, I you know it's like why do we have white she said like you clearly was not white you know but it's because artists have presented this image of what he should look like over the centuries uh but in a way because you're leaving out the skin tones or the what they look like you're kind of leaving that up for us it's almost like leaving it up for our own imagination of what they should look like and we get to kind of create that in that space um, exactly yeah exactly yeah. You mentioned Africa also. And uh, in my public health part of my career, I spent yes, I'm some sure time you have a lot of information in about Africa. <laughs> well, there, um, I used to have a slide of a woman um, holding a sort of a water um, container and holding another a plastic one full of water and a child mm -hmm. and another child wrapped around her, her torso. And, uh, yeah. and I would flash it to my medical students or schools at the school of public health and show I met Superman and it's a woman. Yeah, yeah, really. Um, but the healers of Africa, you know, um, midwives and, and they get a, a lot of flack themselves because they were employed out of necessity. And mm -hmm. they're now sort of being told, well, you don't have a role now that the medical system has come in. Yes. And, and, sorry. Sorry. And in some countries that that okay. um, that is being pushed back against, so hopefully, to make them part of the establishment because they have a huge contribution that they can make. And so the sort of role of healers sure. and women in Africa is so interesting. Um, so yes, I hope love that you get that. there. Um, be happy to talk to you about it for the little bit that I can contribute. Yeah, well, I, I um, 
in my research, I have noticed that, you know, there was in the midwifery uh, profession, there was actually, it was traditionally a woman's uh, profession. And then there was sort of this Victorian notion that no, women shouldn't do it anymore. And, um, you know, you can't get a, you know, women shouldn't work, blah, blah, blah. So this idea that women have been here all along, and then they, um, you know, through the, through different forces, whether it was, you know, school not being uh, available to them or social customs, yeah, right. um, you know, all these other uh, religious ideas, et cetera. I mean, they've sort of been deteriorating in a way too. Um, and now we have this idea of, um, you know, in the paper, just like once a week, there's always an article about how, um, you know, maternal health and maternal death is, um, you know, Scott is enormous in some parts of the world, even in the United States and in, in our country, countries. But... Yes. And, you know, they just developed, they have this um, contraption to help with um, hemorrhaging now. Um, anyway, not to go into the weeds about this, but um, it, it's, even though I'm dealing with women that are from the 14th century, it's extremely relevant to what's going on. And the more things change, the more things they of course, Yes. And now with Roe v. Wade being, you know, overturned, women will have another role, which is, you know, it'll fall to them and they'll come, they'll meet the, some of the need, but it's yes. very exactly. sad. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But this idea that women have been healing themselves in charge of their own bodies for a long time is i i think one of my the premise that i'm trying to get across yes yeah. Yeah. and their community too if yes essentially yes. holding it together yes and, and how information has been passed down from generations orally sometimes sometimes through manuscripts and recipe books um and you know uh anyway yeah. This is so cool. Thank you so much for doing that. And oh, well, thank you. The group you. of healers I'm fascinated by, and, and all of them, actually. Oh, but... well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's fabulous. Um... Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Ada, for bringing our attention to Marimi's incredible work. Uh, it was always a pleasure to see you. Um, next, or in two weeks, I always want to say next week. In two weeks, uh, we have a, a sculptor from uh, Dickinson College, uh, Anthony Servino, uh, and she's or he is being presented uh, by uh, Melissa Uchuji, so you, who was here two weeks ago, if you guys recall. Uh, so join us in two weeks for another awesome ACO artist discussion. So thanks again. Yeah, and happy Mother's Day and to all the mothers in your lives. Yeah, happy Mother's Day <laughs> and to all mothers. That's yeah, good timing. We hope to attend your your opening at at a Rose Gallery. Yes, please, or you know, stop by. Um, another time and I'd love to you know walk you through the show too so wonderful thank you and the recording will be in the next couple of days um will be up in the, in the next couple of days so thank you we can review and enjoy thank you bye 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 thanks guys